Good morning, church. Yeah. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise in this place. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're so excited that you're here. My name is Pastor John. I'm one of the staff members here at New Anthem Church, and uh, we want to say just a special welcome to you wherever you are from. If you are a brand new guest, we want to say an even more special, even specialer welcome to you. Uh, Welcome to New Anthem Church. Uh, We want to welcome not just the New Anthem family today, but also the Journey Church family in the house. Come on, let's celebrate them. And right right now we are two churches meeting under one roof because there is limited real estate in Mount Clemens. And so uh, we're excited to have the Journey Church family with us. And we don't only have the Journey Church family, but we also have some awesome people tuned in watching right now by way of Facebook and YouTube and our app and the Journey Facebook page. Come on, let's welcome our online audience. Amen. Hey, we're so excited you're here as well. And if you could right now, just go ahead and drop the word new. If you are new, right in the comment section, either below or to the right of your screen. Our moderators are also going to drop a virtual connect card. Fill that out. And it's a great way to connect to the heart of our church. It's such an amazing thing to be able to connect all one family uh, online and even through our brand new app. And we're excited about that uh, for so many reasons. And if you haven't yet, be sure to download that. There's an awesome prayer feature um, that it's been great to see people submit prayers. I've submitted prayers and, and I get notifications throughout the day. This person just got done praying for you. This person just got done praying for you. It's amazing. And so be sure to download that. Uh, and it's also a great way to find out what's going on in the life of our church in terms of events, hearing about announcements. Maybe you're the kind of person where you leave Sunday and they're like, wait, what's going on this week? What's going on in a couple weeks? When's Easter? When's the Easter services? The great thing about the app is we're going to be pushing you those notifications, reminding you of all those things, not every single day, uh, but uh, once a week with all the big stuff that's going on in our church. And so we'd love you to, uh, to just engage with us on that. It's a great uh, way to do that. And especially for those of you that are tuned in online, we definitely want to connect with you, engage on the app. Uh, and we're actually live uh, for the first time this week on our app as well, which we're excited about. Uh, and we're going to have more announcements to come Uh, along with our app in the next handful of weeks. And so uh, we want you to know this, that wherever you're from, whatever your background might be, that you are welcome here at New Anthem Church. And I was thinking in the last, over the last couple of weeks, this phrase came to mind um, that I thought I originated. And I thought I felt really good about myself because I thought I came up with this phrase, but I didn't, this slogan. But I was like, I was thinking about church and I was thinking about all the new families that we've had this last handful of weeks. And I was like, man, New Anthem Church, when you're here, your family. And then I, 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 didn't, I didn't realize it at the time, but that's actually Olive Garden's slogan, if you didn't know. <laughs> and so I was feeling so good about myself, and I'm like, oh, okay. But it's even more true for us, right? Because the truth, yeah, because you're not actually family at Olive Garden. You're not even eating real Italian food, right? Um, and so uh, you are here, you are, if you are here, if you're under the sound of my voice and regardless of what your background looks like and, and, and what, where you came from or what your week even looked like, we want you to know that you're home. And that's why we say welcome home here at New Anthem Church. We hope it feels like home to you. We hope it feels like home to you, Journey uh, fam- Church members as well, Journey family. We're excited to have you here. And I'm excited over the next handful of weeks to kind of kind of catch you up on where we're going to be going. Uh, we're going to spend the next handful of weeks uh, in this book of Ephesians. And if you didn't know, I planned on spending no more than six weeks in the books of Ephesians because there's six chapters. And I was going to kind of pull the meat from uh, a chapter each uh, single week. And what happened was I talked to a a pastor who was actually going through the book at the same time we were, Pastor Ken, who preached uh, in week three of our series. And he said, "Uh, well, we're going to be in Ephesians for like eight months. And I was like, okay, you know, all of us have our own strategies and, uh, you know, yours is a a little kooky, but whatever. And I didn't really think much about it. But then what happened was as we were going into week one, uh, uh, Pastor Ken and I were actually studying together. And what was happening is we were digging up all of this truth and all of this meat and really understanding, starting to understand the depths of this book that Paul writes to the church or this letter that Paul writes to the church of Ephesus. And what we realized is, man, I I actually went back to my notes and like, I think we're going to be here for a few months. So I went back to Ken. I was like, I think we're going to be in Ephesians for a few months. He's like, yeah, that's right. I told you. I told you. It's not going to be eight months. 
So <laughs> I would never do that to you. Maybe it will be. I don't know. But, but we're, we're, going through, we're going through real slow. And what I love about this is, is really the purpose of this uh, text, where we're, especially where we're going today, is to really demystify the book of Ephesians, to really demystify what really is oftentimes complex writings, because Paul was an aggressive theologian, and he was aggressive about the word of God, and he was very heady, and he was a deep thinker. And oftentimes when we read his letters and we read his writings to the church, so many things can get lost in translation. Sometimes the things we read are the things that we kind of absorb and understand. They're kind of some general abstract truth, um, some lofty general things about the Word of God, but not really things that we can practically apply to our lives. And what I believe we're going to discover and continue to discover in this series is that when we real do real intense work to uncover the biblical truth that I believe Paul and the Lord Jesus is pointing us to, we can find some real church, a real truth, not just for an ancient church in the early church, uh, but uh, for us, New Anthem Church in 2021. Amen? And so I'm excited to go into the Word of God today. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be finishing up chapter 2 of Ephesians as we continue on in our series called Get Rich Quick. Get Rich Quick. And if this is your first week here, don't be nervous. We say this every week. Don't be nervous. This isn't a prosperity gospel sermon because on the contrary, we're not talking so much about the riches here, the tangible riches in this life, how much money you have, the the investments that you have. This isn't one of those messages. And if you saw that title and got excited because you're like, oh, it's going to be one of those messages and I'm about to receive my blessed blessing and my numbers, the zeros in my bank account at the end of whatever numbers on my bank account are about to go up and increase. And I'm about to get a blessing, a financial blessing from the Lord, maybe, but that's not what this message is about. That's not what this message is about because we're talking about riches beyond this life. We're talking about riches that are eternal, riches that are everlasting, that go outside of the world of the tangible, and ultimately, as we've said those last uh, handful of weeks, will echo, hopefully echo, into eternity. That's the kind of riches I want. Is is that the kind of riches that you want today? Is, Is that what you're desperate and hungry for? I am, especially coming off of this last year, I have grown tired and exhausted with what this world has to offer. You with me? I've grown tired and exhausted, and and, and I'm, I'm in pursuit of something more, pursuit of something deeper, perhaps in pursuit of something that is pandemic proof in pursuit of something eternal and everlasting. And this is what we're, we're diving into, the truth that I believe we're going to de- uncover today as we look to dis- demystify this, ch- this letter to the church of Ephesus. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn, w- turn, turn there with me. If you're tuned in online, you can go to the Bible app or go to um, BibleGateway.com, punch in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 14. Let's pray before we do, and, uh, and then we'll give the rest of this morning up to the Lord our God. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for this time. This morning, I thank you for every single person, maybe believer, maybe skeptic, maybe unbeliever, under the sound of my voice. You love all of them, and you've drawn every single person here for a specific reason and a specific purpose, and I believe by divine appointment. And I believe you have a divine lesson that you're wanting to teach us. And so my prayer is the same, that our hearts would be open, that our minds, that our souls would be receptive to receive exactly what you want us to receive. I believe you have a tailor-made message for every single person, a tailor-made word for every person in this room. And so would we receive it with openness and with gladness? God, we love you. We thank you for who you are, for loving us in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Verse 14 We'll start, Paul writes, and he continues and finishes up this chapter. He says this, For he himself is our peace, who made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. 
In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. May God bless the reading of his word today. We, if you're like me, you read through that text, maybe you listened, maybe you're looking at the words on the screen or down in your Bible, and maybe there were a handful of points that as we were reading, you went, huh? Like, what does that mean? Like, what, is, <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? Like, what is Paul going on about here? And I got to admit, even at a first glance, and Ephesians is one of my favorite books, this is a piece of chapter two that I, find myself, I found myself scratching my head. I, I found myself really having to do t- some detective work because every single phrase, every single word, every single uh, a spot of the Bible that's given is ultimately for our good and for our instruction and for our correction. And so we can know that even in the text that we turn to, that we point to, we find ourselves confused. We only find maybe two or three phrases that we can really understand or comprehend that there is still a lesson. There is still a truth. This is why we need to study the word of God. This is why we need to learn how to, to study theology. So when we read texts like this, that we find ourselves scratching our heads, that when we learn how to study God's word correctly, we can find the applicable truth that we can apply to our life. Amen? And so we're going to take some time to kind of slow walk through this verse expositorily, verse by verse. We're going to be looking at each verse, uh, nearly every single verse in this text, and and uncovering some truth. So it doesn't just sound like Paul rattling off some Christianese to the church of Ephesus, but it can be something that can impact us. Now, there is a shift at this point in the chapter because um, Paul is going from a focus really on the individual in chapters one and the first part of chapter two to really the church as an organization, and he makes some statements that that are not really just for an individual, but for us as the church, and then he starts talking about the individual, then he starts talking about the organization and the organism of the church and how God purposed it to operate, and so he's transitioning between these two ideas, and with that in mind, we can now read this in proper context. So Paul continues on in verse 14, and he says, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Now, another translation um, uh, says uh, a wall of separation. Instead of, instead of a dividing wall of hostility, it's a wall of separation. And in the ancient days, in the temple, in between the court of Gentiles and the court of women, there was a physical barrier, an actual physical wall separating Jews and Gentiles. Like, can you imagine for a moment that kind of separation and segregation inside of our church? Like, we come in, and it's like, okay, all the Christians and Bible thumpers over here, and all you non-Christians and heathens over here. Like, can you imagine that kind of separation? This is what was going on in the church. And this is what Paul was alluding to through Christ's finished work, one of the functions of the cross, one of the functions of what Jesus came here to do was to do more than provide a way that as we believe in him, we would experience eternal life and life with Jesus. One of the other functions of Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection was to break down this, uh, this wall of division inside the church. Because the common lordship is greater than any previous division. This is the truth that Paul is pointing us to. So this idea goes beyond just Jews and Gentiles. This division that Paul is talking about was a, was a greater concept that he was pointing not just this church over 2,000 years ago to, but New Anthem Church over 2,000 years later to. A, a, a rich truth that we can apply to our life. That there is unity, that there is this this division that God doesn't want to see in his church. There is a division that one of the purposes of Jesus was to break down inside of the church. And this division might not just be between Christians and non-Christians. It might be a political division. It might be an ideological division. It may be an economic division. It might be a geographical division division. We see all of these, and we, for all time, we've seen all of these divisions inside of the church. And for those of us that don't understand that one of the purposes of Jesus was to break down this wall of separation, means that ultimately they don't understand, we don't understand, 
what it's like, what it means to be under the lordship of Jesus. And so this is universally true. As a function of the cross, this is universally true for us as believers. And this changes our lens in how we approach people, how we approach the world around us. Because without applying this truth to our life, we have two options when it comes to crazy people we can't stand on social media, fight or flight. Like, stay away from me, I'm ignoring you, I'm canceling you, or, or let's do this, throw it out, and I'm going to be the keyboard warrior and defend my president. I see you guys on social media. And so, there is this wall of separation that Jesus wants to break down. It goes beyond just political. This is actually one of the reasons, if you didn't know, that New Anthem Church is a non-denominational church. Not because we hate denominations. I wouldn't be saved if denominations didn't exist. I love denominations. But our choice to be a non-denominational church was a step to say we want as few barriers as possible. Now, non-denominational has kind of become a denomination in and of itself. But, but the truth still remains, and, and the purpose still remains, that we're trying to remove as many walls as possible. That just like Paul writes to this new Christian church, we want to try to keep the main thing the main thing, and we want to major on the majors, on the important things, the truth of Scripture, the truth of the gospel, essential doctrine. We want to major on these things and these secondary issues. In other words, the secondary doctrine that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with, with how someone gets, gets saved or, or, or the Christian walk or the gospel at all. There's these outside theological issues. Do you realize that there's, there's churches for the last, who knows how many years, who have split because of these issues? Like, I personally know a pastor who, who was fired from his church because he refused to preach the pre-tribulation rapture. If you don't know, what that means is um, a belief that, um, that before all the bad stuff, before all the crazy stuff happens, we're going to be like whisked away into the air, and we're going to be caught up with Jesus in the air. We're going to end up in heaven, and we get out of here just like the Left Behind movies, and all of our clothes will be left here. It'll be really creepy. Like, like... Like, he didn't, he didn't necessarily want to preach that. It, it wasn't essential doctrine. And they removed him from the church. See, I, I want us, as we're studying Paul's context and, and what he's looking at, and as he's, he's kind of shape-shifting and, and directing this church, I want you to deeper and better understand the church that I believe God is calling us to be. And the truth is, there is a massive spirit of division in the local church in America. And if it isn't some crazy pastor that's uh, embezzling a bunch of money or, or running around with some woman that's not his wife and, and, and seeing the church collapse that way, it's typically the division of the people inside the church. And we don't want that to be our story. That's why we're going to major on the majors. I, I've, I've been a part of a church. In fact, the church that really shaped my faith had a church split inside of it because of a purchase of carpet. <laughs> carpet. See, the, the, this isn't just division between a, a, a political division, ideolo ideological division. It, it, there's a myriad of different reasons and things that drive us and preferences that we have. But when those preferences uh, dictate how in the spirit we're going to come into the house of God, we can find division in the midst. And I believe all of this division holds us back from becoming the church God wants us to be. And so we have to be a church who's united, who's about unity. Now, I want to be real honest. I'm not saying some of those uh, theological issues like, um, you know, pre-trib. There's people in this room, I'm sure, that believe like it is possible. You can absolutely lose your salvation. And yet there are people in this room that are like, no, once you're a child of God, you can't lose your salvation. And you're both saved and you're both going to heaven. 
And that's an important conversation, and it's a fun conversation to have, and there's lots of biblical evidence for both. But us pontificating about those parts of theology ultimately aren't helping the marriage that's on the rocks and the wayward son or daughter, the person that's struggling, the skeptic in their faith. All that time spent quarreling. And so Paul's going to speak about this a lot all through his writings and all through his books, about the quarreling of the church on these secondary issues that keep us Keep us away and keep us off the path and, and, and not on mission, running after the person and work of Christ. And so he, here is my promise to you, that if you want to get together with me and have all of these theological discussions, I'm game. Now, you have to buy me food. Like, you have to take me, to, you can take me to Mission Barbecue, you can take me to Krispy Kreme Donuts. Uh, as long as there's some kind of good food involved, I will go. I will, if you want me to argue uh, against you, that's great. If you just want me to agree with you, like, I'll give you, I have the scriptural backing probably for both sides. We can argue all the live long day, but you, you have to buy me food. You can't, like, take me to a park. And just like say, I want to talk to you. Like if there's an ice cream man at the park, maybe we'll talk. But the, my point is, my point is, I love engaging in those conversations. I love engaging in those debates. But that spirit of quarreling, that spirit of debate and division on things that aren't essential for our faith and our doctrine, it's just not going to become a distraction in this church. And so, yeah. So I want to set the record straight. New Anthem Church, our church right here, Journey Church, will remain a place that preaches the full counsel of God, that preaches Christ and him crucified, that preaches the word of God, uh, unapologetically, unadulterated, the word of God, that preaches the power, the access, and the gifts of the spirit of God, the weight of sin, and the reality of hell, the gospel. This is what we believe. This is what we preach. And as a church, we're going to intentionally stay away from those secondary teachings in a way that would divide the church. Not that we'll never have those conversations or teach those types of theology, but we'll never do it in such a way that it would cause division amongst the brethren. And so um, let's move on to verse 16. I say it on verse 14, way too long. Let's go to verse, uh, drop down to verse 16. It says this, and, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the, cr- through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And so what is the motive that Paul is, is, is kind of pointing to through this, uh, through this uh, unity? What, what, is, what is he saying? Through this wall of separation that Jesus went through the trouble of obliterating, it wasn't so we could just be better Christians. It wasn't so we could be just shinier Christians. No, it was to put to death the spirit of hostility. And that isn't, watch this, this isn't just in the church. You see, the church is supposed to be driving unity in the world. This is why we we have two churches right now meeting under one roof. This is why we had two pastors in first service coming to just check things out and learn from us and learn from what we do and and why as soon as the service is over, I'm driving to Southwest Detroit to help with the church launch there. This is why we do that. This is why we reach out. This is why we work so hard because if we're going to see revival, it's not going to be from this church getting bigger and bigger. It's from this church growing and joining with other movements that are growing and, and setting aside our denominational differences in our secondary issues and setting all of those aside and coming together under the banner of Jesus to see something significant for the sake of the gospel. Amen? Amen. And so and so this is how this is going to happen. We want to see unity. And part of the function of the cross is to put to death this hostility. And the way God designed the church to work is that as we become unified. See, this is what he prayed for us. You realize he prayed for this church in, in, in having a, a last meal before he was about to go off to be tortured and then nailed and murdered to a cross. What was his prayer? His prayer was for us, the church, that we could be one, that we could be unified, not New Anthem, the big C church, that we could be unified as New Anthem, we could be unified as Journey, that we could come together to do significant things. Why? Because we are ultimately better together and he wants to remove this hostility because what happens when a church can do that? 
and a church is growing and unified, see, what happens is we can impact a city because the city sees us, and God uses his plan A for changing the world, the vehicle of the church, to show the world what unity looks like. And I believe God wants to purpose the church, and God wants to purpose our church to be a demonstration of what harmony and unity looks like politically. To, be what, to, to show the world what harmony and unity looks like racially. We, we need to be a different looking church. And to reach people no one's reaching, we have to do things no one's doing. That's why we do things, we're just a little bit off, right? But this isn't just church as usual. We do things just a little bit differently because we believe there's a unique and specific call on us, on New Anthem Church, to impact people that no one's reaching right now. And so we move on to verse 17. I love this. It says this, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Do you know, this might sound ridiculous to you, uh, people get mad at me all the time, and here's what they say. They say, Pastor John, why do you preach Jesus every single week? <laughs> Thanks for the compliment, first of all. <laughs> um, yeah, um, if you didn't know, that's what the entire Bible's about, second of all. But, but here's what they say. They're like, e even if you're preaching Noah, even if you're preaching the Old Testament, you bring it back to Jesus and you bring it back to the cross. You bring it back to the, uh, the gospel. And I'm like, that's so amazing that you're getting it. Like you're get that's like, you know what I mean? Like, like, that's the gospel. That's the Bible. You're getting the word of God. Keep listening. It'll click in a minute. But they, they take issue with it. Why? Because, well, most of the people that say that, they've been Christians forever. They know the story of Jesus. They know the gospel. So why do we go, why do we, why do we do an altar call every single week and give people the opportunity to form relationships with Jesus? Because Jesus is our message. Jesus is all of it. It's always going to be Jesus, beginning and end. And this is what Paul is alluding to in verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. It wasn't more peace. It wasn't different peace. It wasn't special peace for those who were near. It was peace and and peace. And so the message will always be Jesus. And some of y'all are like, but, uh, but Pastor John, Paul didn't say Jesus. Paul said peace. <laughs> and I was ready for you type A'ers. Go to verse 14. Back to verse 14. Back to verse 14. Here it is. For he himself is our peace. Amen. We're talking about Jesus, baby. <laughs> And he's our peace, and he's the answer, and he's the completion, and he's the fulfillment, beginning, end, past, present, and future. Jesus will always be the answer. Don't you see how easy the job of a pastor really is? The answer is always the same. What should I do? My marriage is in shambles. Jesus, what should I do about my kid? Jesus, what should I do about this financial issue? Jesus, the answer is and always will be Jesus. I don't care how long you've been saved. For the skeptic in this room, Jesus is your answer. For the person that's been studying theology for the last 20 years, your answer, friend, is Jesus. In fact, I find so often there is a danger for those of us that have been saved a long time. We have a harder time uh, understanding and fully realizing that it's that simple to quantify. We're actually trying to look elsewhere. We try to look elsewhere in scripture. We try to find things and even add things, put ourselves into the text and find things that aren't even there instead of just coming back to the conclusion that is really the, God's purpose for his entire word pointing to his son, Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. This is why, friends, Jesus is our message. This is why on the banner out there it says that we want people to experience Jesus and experience him in a new way and in services and in experiences and in small groups and why we want to equip people to live like Jesus and we want to empower people to serve Jesus. For those who are far off from Jesus and those that are close to Jesus, our strategy will be the same strategy as Jesus, to the glory of God alone. Amen? Amen. Verse 18 says this. For through him, we have both access in one spirit to the Father. 
Now, this is like a little transitional side note that Paul is is giving, and and he's just giving us this little piece of information. Ultimately, what he's saying is there isn't a particular group that gets a special or unique access to God. Now, many of us are seeing that word access, and I believe we're, we're, we're looking at that word and maybe thinking something that Paul didn't necessarily uh, uh, mean. And what I mean by that is, is um, there's some context when we look into the original Greek uh, of the word access. And the word access comes from the word prosagoge, and it means a worthy royal introduction, so it'd be like if um, when you came in the auditorium, I had one of my um, staff members um, sitting at the back, and every time you know someone came in, uh, you would just be announced. And so I would have Jed or I would have Alyssa there, like right at the door, yelling in your ear as you came in, and someone would come in and be like, Tiffany Switek, like that, like they would they would shout their name. It's a it's a royal entrance. And so some of us we read that word access, and you're like, cool, I have Jesus, the gates open. I guess you can go on in. No, no, it's not like that. Wait, do you have your badge? Okay, no, no, you can go on in. No, when we are in Christ, what that gives us more than just access with Jesus, we have Jesus giving us this royal introduction to the Father. And so we have access, we have this royal introduction, it says in verse 18. In verse 19, we move on, it says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And this is a recall. Um, he, Paul is repeating a theme that we talked about last week, that we're no longer outsiders. We're no longer on the outside. We've been brought close. We've been brought near um, by the blood of Jesus and by Jesus' work. And then in verse 20, he says this, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being uh, himself being the cornerstone. Now, There's a note here that I want to stress because, um, believe it or not, many pastors, many um, uh, church denominations, church leaders, take this little piece here. Take the first half of this piece where it says, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. Many have taken that, and they build their home ministry with a scriptural backing with the idea that it is okay to build an entire church and an organization on an individual to build their organization on, on, a, on, a, on a broken, imperfect uh, man or woman of God, a preacher, a personality, someone charismatic, someone that hears from God, someone that has giftings, and to build their ministry on them and say it's okay because they take the scripture out of context. Because what Paul is actually referring to here is talking about the teachings and writings, the, the God-inspired writings that the men of God that have come before him and up until this point had written. So he's talking about the Bible. When he's talking about a foundation of the apostles and prophets, he's talking about the scriptures that they wrote. And so we get this wrong. Pastors get this wrong. They use this to, hey, it's it's built on me. It's built on me. They build their ministries this way. They lead people this way. They lead people on their gift. They put, the, they put uh, apostle at the end of their title. They put prophet at the end of their title. And many of them lead people astray. Many of them tell people what to believe. They don't point them to Jesus. They point them to themselves and their word, not God's word, their word. And they tell them how to vote. And they tell them what the future holds. According to like 15 or so prophets that I follow, the world was supposed to end like three years ago. It was supposed to end over and over and over and over again. This place was supposed to get, to get nuked a long time ago. Our president was not supposed to be our president. And at what point do we start seeing these prophets ultimately being, being shown, depicted as false prophets, which is, means what? They got it wrong. And say, okay, maybe I should worship Jesus. Maybe I should do what his word says. Maybe I should tap into my own relationship with Jesus and not these imperfect women. Please don't put me on a pedestal. I'll knock myself off your pedestal. Please don't put me on a pedestal. Don't put any church leader on a pedestal. 
This is what many of us do. But the glory isn't to the apostles and prophets. The foundation is in the word of God, which is God-breathing, God-inspired. And God used broken, imperfect individuals to write his perfect word. And that's what we build our foundation on. So what is the foundation? The word of God. So otherwise this would read, we build the foundation on these men. We build the foundation on your pastor, Pastor John. It would say that right there. <laughs> and then it says this. And how do we know this? Well, the, the, the second half of verse 20 is going to give us a little indication. It says this, Christ, Jesus himself, being our cornerstone. Watch this. The word cornerstone literally means uh, a, 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 at the tip of the angle. And it refers to a capstone or binding stone that holds the whole structure together. And it often has a royal name inscribed on it. And in the East, it was considered to be even more important than the foundation. And so what is our foundation? It is the word of God. And what is holding all of it together? Even more important and even stronger than the foundation, this is Jesus. And so what are we building our church on? You're starting to get a, a kind of a, a, to key in on what is our model? What is our church model as New Anthem Church? This is why we stand on the word of God. This is why we don't use other books. We're not using other books to try to support what we're saying. No, we use the word of God and everything starts and finishes and everything that we do with the word of God and we stand on it. Why? Because all of it in the end points to Jesus who is our cornerstone. He's holding all things together. Verse 21 says this, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. This is what God is wanting to build. God is wanting to build something. There are three attributes of the church that we're going to be looking at, found in verse 21, which I just read, that we're going to spend some time in and kind of take apart. The first one is this. Paul is saying the church ultimately is a building. The church is a structure. It's something that God is constructing with his people, and he's building. And these, these members of the body, they have different functions, and he's wanting to build it up, to build something that points to heaven and glorifies his name. And he is arranging his church for his glory and his purposes. Number two, the church is a dwelling place, and it's a place, hopefully, where God resides and God lives. And it's never meant to be an empty house. It's never meant to be a museum. No, uh, it, it has someone living inside of it. And the church is both a living place for God and his people. Number three, the church was purposed to be a temple. In other words, holy and set apart. And as we serve and as we come into the house of God and as we offer up sacrifices and we, we give financially and we give of our time and we give of our talents and we give of our praise and a sacrifice of praise unto the Lord, he receives glory at seven, it says in Hebrews 13, 15. And I believe, church, that these same attributes that I just mentioned, the structure, the building, the dwelling place, the temple, this is something God is not wanting us to have a perspective that he's just building here at New Anthem. But I think he's wanting to build the same thing in and through you. Because your life, as we talked about a few weeks ago, is a structure. Your life is a building. It's something that God is building and constructing. Your life in Christ is meant to be a dwelling place a place where the Spirit of God lives and moves and teaches you and stirs and blows your mind. And the, who you are, your very existence, is also meant to be a temple. In other words, a holy place set apart for the purposes of God. Why? Because there's a work that God is wanting to do in you. There's a work God is wanting to do through your life. And it starts with you today. God wants these things not just for the big C church. He's wanting it for New Anthem, and he's wanting it for you as an individual. There is a theologian named Adam Clark, and he explains how God's work in the church gave glory and wisdom and power and, love, and the love of God. How the, the God's culmination, God's end game with all of this was to ultimately have something built that would bring more glory to his name. Because we're not playing church games. We're not a church just to be a church. 
We're a church trying to bring more glory to the God of the universe. And he says this about the church. There is nothing as noble as the church, seeing that it is the temple of God. There is nothing so worthy of reverence, seeing God who dwells in it. There is nothing so solid since Jesus Christ is the foundation of it. There's nothing so high since it reaches as high to the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There is nothing so perfect and well-proportioned since the Holy Spirit is the architect. There is nothing more beautiful because it is adorned with building stones of every age, every place, every people, from the highest kings to the lowest peasants, with the mo- with most beautiful, brilliant scientists and the simplest of believers. There is nothing more spacious since it is spread over the whole earth and takes in all who have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the lamb. There is nothing so divine since it is a living building animated and inhabited by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And that's the church that I see for us today. This is the church that I want us to strive to be. And you know what? It's not going to happen by just wishing that it happens. It's not going to happen by hoping that God does it. It's going to happen by the people of God, which is the church. The church body wanting to be and strive to be that kind of church. Not a perfect church, but one that's a beautiful structure that points to heaven and glorifies the God of the universe. This is what God is building, and I believe, friends, that it starts with you. What would this church look like if it was full of people that came to church wanting that? What would this church look like if it was full of people that believed God was going to move every week in that kind of way? that he was building that in you, that he was building that in this room with this organization so that we could not just be better believers, we could be useful believers, we could be effective believers that do great work for God because someday all of us are going to stand before him in glory. And after having the conversation of whether we're saved, whether we're a Christian, whether we've embraced Jesus with our life here on earth, The conversation is going to, the second conversation is going to be very simple. And it's going to say, what did you do with your time and your talents and your treasures that I gave you? What did you do to further my kingdom? What did you do for me? For those of us that served in the kingdom of God and the house of God are going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And I long for that. And I work for that. And I fight for that. And I believe we can become a church where it's not just the pastor who lives that way, but an entire church body that lives that, that radical way. I believe this is when the way, only way we're going to see revival come forth in our city when the people of God, Christianity becomes less of a Sunday hobby and more of a lifestyle, a direction, something we start living every single day. Amen? It starts with you today, friends. Let's bow our heads in this place. As we close this morning, I want to give an opportunity maybe for the person who has never formed a relationship with Jesus. Maybe some of this maybe even seemed confusing to you. You would say, Pastor John, I'm not a Christian. You can become a Christian. I I was speaking to it today earlier. Maybe you are a skeptic. Maybe you are a wanderer. Maybe you're someone who just straight up recently even rejected Jesus. You know something? Jesus still wants you. And Jesus says you can come home with all the questions, with all the skepticism, with all the wonderings. You can form a relationship with Jesus. It can start for you today. And so I want to give you that opportunity to start a brand new life with Jesus. All I'm going to ask is on the count of three, you just lift your hand in the air that you respond outwardly for what the Holy Spirit is doing inwardly. I believe when you do that, it makes it all the more real for you. You'll always remember the moment where you said yes to Jesus, where you raised your hand, you made an outward declaration of an inward change. And so if that's you today, I want a relationship with Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity. One, God loves you so much. Two, the Bible says today 
is the day of salvation. Three, if that's you, just lift your hand in the air. I want to walk with Jesus. I want a relationship with Jesus. Awesome. Anyone else? Anyone else? The greatest decision you could ever make. I believe this is your moment, friends. Awesome. Maybe you're tuned in online today. It's easy for you as well. You can just put yes right in the comment section. As in, I want to say yes to Jesus. You can also pray this prayer along right with us. Our moderators are going to also reach out to you and connect with you on, on next steps that you can take. So for all of our brothers and sisters online, everyone that's making decisions in the room today, let's pray this prayer out loud to support them. Let's say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. Help me to live for you the best that I can. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, can we celebrate with those who made first-time decisions? It's amazing. It's amazing. We're so excited for you. I love to always add this, that um, it's not just a prayer alone that saves you. What a prayer does is it starts a relationship. It's a relationship with Jesus that makes all the difference. Uh, and so we're excited. Welcome home. Welcome to the family. For those of you that made the decision online, welcome home. We have next steps we want you to take uh, to start you on your journey. We have a growth track, which happens next week in between our first and second service. Great way, uh, great on-ramp for you, for the church, uh, or if you're interested in membership. It's a, it's a one-stop shop, so it's a great uh, great step for you uh, to get more connected here at New Anthem. Church, we love you. We're excited as we get to ramp up for Easter. We're excited to, to do that with you. Uh, and this is our first Easter in the building. Amen. And my goal... My goal is to preach it without having COVID. I, I, I preached last year without COVID um, from, a, from a camera, and it was rough. Uh, and so I'm excited to have a, really what is, is going to be our first uh, in-person uh, Easter service, and we're believing it's going to be awesome. So I want to encourage you to invite people. There is uh, green invite cards out there. Please take these. We've already heard so many stories of people handing these out and encouraged by it and coming. And so the service times, the address, all of it's on there, uh, and hand these out to people. Invite them. We'd love to see this place filled out, not just so we can have a big service, so people can hear Jesus' message and people can hear the gospel and come home. Amen? This is why we exist. Amen. Well, we love you guys and we pray for you every week. Our prayer is always the same, that the Lord blesses you and keeps you, causes his face to shine upon you, turns his countenance towards you, is gracious to you, and gives you peace. And why? Because the best is yet to come. We'll see you guys next Sunday. Hey! Thank you so much for checking out New Anthem Church's YouTube channel. It is our heart and our prayer that this message would be encouraging and impactful for you. If you enjoyed this video, we have tons just like it already on our channel, and we would encourage you to hit the subscribe button either down below or right over here. That way you can stay up to date on when we post the messages. Now, if you don't want to wait for them to come out, we do live stream at 11 a.m. every single Sunday on Facebook at My New Anthem Church. Now here at New Anthem, our vision is so simple. We want to experience Jesus, we want to equip his people, and we want to empower the world. So with that, we want to say we love you and God bless.